guys are too. We did a happy as you know it clap your hands a long time ago. Uh, too bad I didn't do that one okay, right? Um, but uh, glad to see you all. Glad to see everybody in good spirits. And, uh, glad to have such uh, wonderful friends and family here today. So love you all, my brothers and sisters. So it's like Jesus said, this is my family. Um, you are my family. So I'm happy and proud to have uh, such a wonderful family as you guys. Um, wonderful uh, service plan today. Um, uh, of course, we've got Gary. Uh, awesome, awesome Gary. Community <coughs> found that Gary brings is so unique and. Uh, powerful voice that he has, and uh, just an awesome, awesome singer. So thank you, brother, for being here and um, providing us with uh, some beautiful music. Um, and of course, Donald on the piano. Can't uh, can't uh, forget her. She's always here, faithful to uh, to play the piano beautifully each and every week for us, and I appreciate that so much. Um, and of course, uh, today I'll be giving the message. Uh, Lon, uh, Lon had told me that he couldn't make it, and then today showed. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, I said, hey, are you, are you really, can you make it or not make it? You know, I'm confused now. So, anyway, he said, yeah, I'm not feeling good anyway. So, uh, we'll continue with me giving the message since like, I prepared one anyway. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Donna and uh, Gary, and they'll get us started with some, uh, some good, beautiful music. All right. Good to see you all again today. Everybody all right? Yeah. Now, come on. Just because you had lunch and want to take a nap, that's no reason to be quiet. Are you doing okay today? Yes. I know I did. Take your hymnal and turn to page 453. Oh, wow. I was thinking 454. 453.
afternoon. I'm going to sing one for you now. It's the one that has a great message to it. And if you want to sing along with me, you're more than welcome to. I never get a, upset or it doesn't bother me at all if somebody wants to sing along with me. And this is one that has the whole message of what salvation is all about. Amen. We have victory. Oh, yes. And that victory Amen. is in Jesus. Amen. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and He bought me With His redeeming blood He loved me me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about His healing, of His cleansing power revealing, how He made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, Come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he loved me with his Okay. 
ain't going to need help. So we'll, we'll try and put it up and see if it's going to stay or not. It probably won't, so you'll probably see you take the triple beta right back down, right? Um, so, let me get up here a little bit and we'll get everything started. Like, uh, like we talked about um, already, um, the uh, uh, sermon is going to be a continuation of our sermon from last week, um, ultimately on the will of God. And I know, you know, the will of God is um, uh, something that each of us, uh, you know, thinks about, each of us struggles with at times in our life, times in our uh, faith, and, you know, it's something that we all, yeah, this is going to think, um, it's something that we all, uh, at different times in our lives, um, wonder about, you know, we, we ask ourselves, you know, how do I know the will of God? And, you know, there are so many people in our world today um, that are, you know, you see them on TV, you see them in so many different places, and they're basically saying that, you know, God talked to me, I got a message from God last night. Um, or they, you know, they uh, ultimately give you all these different things for how to know the will of God through um, subjective things, right? Um, they'll tell you, listen to that little, I there's books on this stuff, it's crazy, but they'll tell you there's, uh, you know, um, Listen to that little voice in your in your head um, for you know God's uh, uh, message and God's will. Hang on, I get it. I'm trying to find my sermon. It's not pulling up on here. Bear with me. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, uh, give me a second. This is done before I got to the pulpit, huh? I've got got to uh, the end of the singing. But as I'm saying, there's so many um, pastors, uh, you know, there's even some of them call themselves apostles uh, today, which, um, quite frankly, they're not. Um, an apostle is somebody that's walked with Christ. And unless they've walked with Christ, and I didn't know about it, because he hadn't returned, they're not an apostle, not according to the definition that, that Christ gave. Um, so, ultimately, uh, they claim that, you know, hey, listen to that little voice in your head, and uh, you know, ultimately you can uh, know God's will that way. Um, unfortunately, that voice in your head um, is not always the most um, uh, reliable. Yeah, because um, it can throw you off, right? Your voice in your own mind is something that um, is uh, uh, shaped by what's going on in your life, right? Shaped by those different experiences you've had in your life. And I talked about this, uh, the first part of this, uh, um, in Sunday school today, that um, I heard a uh, uh, an example here. I heard a uh, an athlete um, a few years back, and he came to uh, came out on TV and talked about how he, um, you know, was going to let everybody know that he had AIDS, um, and that you know he needed to come clean with the world that he had AIDS um, because ultimately um, uh, he wanted them to know he had gotten it through unsafe sex. Um, and unfortunately, uh, his conscience, you know, he said his conscience had uh, uh, basically told him he needed to do this. The problem is, is our conscience is only as good as our uh, experience in life, right? And in this particular person's case, um, he wasn't a Christian. Um, so he was saying that his conscience had convicted him that he needed to come to the world and tell the world that they needed to have safe sex. Whereas what God tells us is, you're not to have sex outside of marriage, period. Doesn't need to be saved, it needs to not be at all, right? Um, and so in his mind, he was being applauded even by half the world. He was saying, oh, this is great, this guy's coming out and he's telling everybody as they said. Well, I would say that, you know, great, you're applauding him, but um, we should stand on what God calls us to do first, right? And so his conscience that he said had convicted him to do this is, again, only as good as your experience or only as good as um, your uh, uh, faith, right? And because he wasn't a Christian, his conscience only called him out on the unsafe sex part, not on the fact that he was having sex outside of marriage with somebody that wasn't a wife, right? Um, and so, ultimately, that's why I'm saying you can't trust your own self, right? You can't trust that, that voice inside your head all the time because it's not always going to give you uh, God's will. Uh, it's going to give you your will, certainly, um, but it may not always give you God's will. Um, and unfortunately, that's what most, um, you know, if the books that you're reading, most of what you're going to hear uh, people tell you is the way to know God's will is through... Um, 
that little voice in your head. And again, I've seen several books on this. I've seen so many different uh, things with it that, uh, unfortunately, um, here, let me get it a different way. Unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. That's not the best way of knowing God's will. Um, we talked last week about how God has different sides of his will, if you, if, if you will. Sorry, if you will. Um, the uh, first side of it that we talked about last week is God revealed it, right? God does reveal to us perfectly uh, in Scripture, and I pointed out several verses for you where he says, my will, right? It's pretty clear it wasn't, you know, something you had to get them out. Um, each of those things that we discussed last week are certainly, uh, essentially, um, are certainly um, uh, God's will. And, uh, again, no question. But all you've got to do to find that out is read the Bible. And that's where each of us should start um, when we are searching for God's will, is with God's word, God's revealed will. What he's already told us, in no uncertain terms, is his will, right? Um, and ultimately, uh, uh, that will help you with your decision uh, to know, first of all, are we following what he's revealed to you? Because if you're not even following that, how can you even come to him for the rest of it, right? Um, it'd be like your child coming to you and living in a half of what you told him, right? Um, that's not acceptable as a parent, is it? Um, you would say to that child, hey, you're being disrespectful, you're being, uh, you're not doing what I told you. Go clean your room. I told you to clean your room. Then you go outside, right? Then you go play or whatever, right? Then we'll go to the park. Um, but until you clean your room, you can't go to the park. Well, uh, if you're not following God's revealed will, what makes you think that he's going to reveal the unrevealed part, right? Um, the part that, that ultimately um, you're searching for. That you keep asking those questions about, well, should I, what should I do with my spare time? Or uh, should I buy this car? Or should I get this money to this person that's asking for it, right? Um, if you're not at least following those things that he's revealed to us, it's going to be very um, unlikely um, that you're going to find the answers to uh, those things that are not revealed. And I'm going to explain why, and it's very uh, important that you understand why that is. It's not that God doesn't want you to know it, it's that you are not going to be able to see it, right? Um, because of the fact that you're not even within God's will, His revealed will, you're not going to be able to see those things that might be a little bit more difficult to see, if that makes sense. As we grow with Christ, we, we become closer to Him, right? We become closer to God. And as we become closer to God, He reveals more to us and with us, right? Um, but if you're not with God, if you're not close to God, it gets harder, not that He's not revealing it, but you get harder to see it, right? It's just like the, the Jewish population. And, you know, we know that we've been told to have a veil over their eyes, right? Each of us has some sort of veil over our eyes. We can only see what we're able to see at that moment in our life, right? God will reveal things to you when you're ready to see them, right? Um, you may not be ready yet to understand that piece of your life. You may not be prepared for it. You may not be able to handle it, quite frankly. And so God is going to reveal those things to you as you can handle it, right? Um, so, again, one of those things that you need to understand is, uh, ultimately, um, ultimately, uh, uh, to be part of, uh, to be able to understand his unrevealed will, you have to be within his revealed will to start with. Um, and like I say, unfortunately, there are so many, you know, good decision making uh, that we do, you should exercise biblical wisdom. Um, and it comes from studying the Bible, studying God's Word, uh, and doing that along with um, God's generous provision. He's going to give you, uh, like I just said, he's going to show you what he wants you to know. Um, and so wisdom comes, that wisdom that you're looking for comes from diligent study. I read my Bible every day, without faith. Um, you know, I know a lot of people go to books and, and all that for uh, their biblical study. I think what book better to study first than God's Word? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to look for John Smith's view of the Bible. I want to look at God's view of God's Word, not John Smith's view of God's Word. So I read the Bible first, right? Um, and I tend to read that and only that. Um, because again, I know, I know that if I ask God to reveal things to me and if I ask for God's wisdom, when I'm ready for it, he'll reveal it. Um, he's going to reveal it in his time, not mine. Um, and so look, that's hard to do sometimes, right? It's hard to understand that you're not going to know because you're not ready to know or you don't need to know. Right? Um, but that's okay too, right? No different than sometimes when your child, uh, you, you, you raised them, right? And they said, Mom, why are we going to such and such? And you said, Because we're not. Why? You don't need to know. You need to tell them, right? So, so 
same thing. Um, they're not driving the car. They don't need to know why. Um, you know, the tire's flat. That's not their problem, you know? Um, and God is the same way, right? There are things that you don't necessarily need to know. It's not going to help you on your journey. So why muddy your mind with something that might confuse you um, or might mess you up, quite frankly? Um, so uh, understand that, that yes, it's hard to, to come to that conclusion um, that there are many things in, in God's uh, uh, providence that He's just not going to share with you when you're not ready. Right and some things, not at all. Uh, you only know about it once you reach out. Um, but, uh, so ultimately, virtually every Christian grasp, grapples with this question of how to know God will in any individual instance, right? Um, and we particularly struggle when we're young. Um, because we're, you know, and young, when I say young, I don't mean necessarily an age. I mean young as a Christian, where you uh, are new to Christianity, or you're not someone that has studied very diligently as a Christian, or not gone to church very much, or whatever, right? So that's somebody that's a new Christian, right? Um, and ultimately, that you're more likely to struggle when you're a new Christian with this question of God's will. Um, so... And, and many different questions you'll have come up in your life. You're going to have a hard time answering, right? What occupation should I pursue? Should I, uh, you know, uh, buy that car? All those different things that we're faced with each and every day, and we're unsure of what we should do. As well as, should I help this person? You know, those, those other questions that are, uh, you know, morality related as well. Um, not just the, the black and white, or I mean the gray area questions, right? Um, unfortunately, many of the books, like I said, the pamphlets on discerning God's will, are filled with a lot of mystical mumbo jumbo. Um, you know, about speaking a uh, sense of peace or listening to uh, for a divine call, uh, putting uh, putting out dreams, right? Like doing it, um, but doing it with your mind, right? Um, I read some wackadoodle stuff on how to figure out God's will, and none of it's real. All of it's not real. It's just a way to sell a book. Um, and quite frankly, it's not worth the, the paper that it's written on. Um, but that kind of discernment is not what Scripture calls for, uh, especially with what we, we read last week, right? And if we examine everything the Bible has to say about knowing God's will, what we discover is that everywhere um, Scripture expressly mentions this subject, it actually sets forth some guidelines. And, and if we put those guidelines together, we get a pretty comprehensive picture of the will for every Christian from God. Um, and this is what our term last week was all about. Those seven different things that we can look to Scripture to show us the revealed will of God. Um, and as a refresher, uh, the seven things were, number one is God's will that we all be saved. Number two is God's will that we be spirit-filled. Number three is God's will that we be sanctified, that we be growing as a Christian, growing more like Him separate from the world. Number four, God's will is that we be submissive. Submissive to Him um, as our Lord and submissive to each other as each other's brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Um, and submissive to um, those rulers and, and uh, those authorities that have been placed above us by God. Um, uh, fifthly, uh, it's our God's will that we suffer. And I know when I say that, people look at you as God wants you to suffer. Not suffer in the sense of suffer, you know, oh, I'm in pain, but suffer for the sake of righteousness, right? Suffer for the sake of being a Christian. Meaning, suffer for doing good when others will do evil, right? When you um, are faced with a situation where somebody wants you to lie, and you say, no, I, I don't lie. I'm a Christian. That's not something I can do. Um, they may then tell you, ah, I don't like you yanking on my next birthday card. That's the kind of suffering I'm talking about. Suffering for being a Christian, suffering for shame and unrighteousness rather than wickedness. Um, I was just talking with somebody today about this very thing, and you stand on righteousness. That's what you do. When you're faced with that, that question, those people are facing you, and they're giving you all the grief, right? And they're being mean and rude and nasty to you. You stand on righteousness. You do what's right, and you be kind to what you do. And then you pray. You pray to God for the strength to continue to do that. Um, but this is what God calls us to do as Christians. We are to suffer and suffer for Him like He did. And part of why we do that, guys, is so that we can truly understand the gift we were given. If you never suffer for something, is it worth much to you? Think about that. And honestly ask yourself that. If you've never suffered anything for it, is it worth anything to you? That plastic bag that you brought your groceries in um, today, did you give it a second thought or did you just talk? Right? It didn't mean anything to you. Because you didn't suffer for it. Now, somebody else 
suffered for it, and I pay it, and I'm sure, right, on that, that, uh, that uh, assembly line. But my point is, is, if you're not suffering for it, it means nothing. And so if you don't see the same kind of suffering that Jesus did, it means nothing to you. You'll never truly understand and appreciate the gift you've been given. And I promise you folks, the gift you've been given is like none other. No, no. There is no other gift on this planet that you can be given that would equal it, even come close to it. And so in order for you to appreciate it, you have to be, you know, uh, some, we were talking about the, uh, our age and the, the type of language that we use earlier, or somebody else I was, um, and I'm going to give you one, an old timey thought, right? Unless you've got skin in the game. Ever heard of that one? Unless you've got skin in the game, you don't care, right? Well, that's what suffering does for you. It gives you skin in the game, um, so to speak. Um, allows you to see that there is a value or worth um, to what Christ has done for you. Um, that's the kind of suffering that I'm talking about. Number six is same thing, that you be thankful. Um, God wants us all to be thankful. Um, not just to Him, but thankful to each other. Thankful to our, you know, to uh, our friends, our family. Thankful to everyone, right? How can you fight with somebody who's thankful and kind and always, you know, uh, being submissive and nice to you? You can't. It's kind of hard, right? And if we're to spread the message of God, um, we have to deal with people that are going to be mean and rude and nasty, right? It's going to happen. I'm from um, I had somebody I invited to service here a few weeks back that he was not real kind in his reply. And I was very thankful to him, right? And that's what we're called to be. Because, look, you'll never get your message across to anybody if you're not. If you come back with the same vitriol that they throw at you, do you think they're going to hear anything you said? No, I guarantee you hear. I know you hear. I know you Because I told him, okay, well that's okay. The invitation is still open. And it always will be open for you. And I hope you change your mind. Because we're talking about, you know, your eternity. Um, and that's important to me for you. Even if it's not for you, it's important to me for you. Because I want to see you where I know I'm going. Um, and that's, you know, unless you respond like that, then I can hear you, right? Um, if I were to just walk away, okay, yeah, um, nothing changes for him. But by me planting that seed, maybe he will change. I hope he does. He may never, but that's what they do. I'm going to do what, Paul, what God calls me to do and be thankful. Um, the uh, seventh thing that God calls us to do is to do good. And to do, to do good not just for others, but uh, to do good for even those that might be our enemies, right? Um, uh, so those are the seven things that are part of God's revealed will. Those are the things that we know He calls us, each one of us to do. So start there. Um, once you are in that position where you are uh, saved, right? Where you are uh, spirit-filled, saved, sanctified, submissive, suffering for God, saying thanks and uh, doing good. When you're there, then I promise you right now, um, and this is it's going to sound crazy, right? Um, if all those aspects of God are realities in your life, you don't need to fret over the other decisions you make. Okay. Um, as long as the options that you face don't involve, you know, uh, forbidden things, right? Um, if you're faced with a question of should I lie or not lie, I think you already know the answer to that, right? Um, what I'm saying is if the question in your mind is something that's not, you know, is not against God's will, then if you are living a life like what I just described, where you are following God's will on those seven things, do whatever you want. Whatever you want. You know why? Because it's not you that will shape your will at that point. It's God that does. And I know that. You know how I know that? He tells me that in the scripture that I've been here to talk about. Uh, as a matter of fact, Psalm 37, 4. And again, you follow along if you want. I'm going to hit a bunch of different verses. Um, so if you can't follow along, that's okay too. Write them down. But Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. He will give you the desires of your heart. But, what's that take? That first part, right? Delight yourself in the Lord. And to delight yourself in the Lord means to be within His will. His revealed will. So if you're within His revealed will, He's going to give you the will that is in your heart to do what you need to do. And like we talked about last week anyway, if you're never, anything you do is never going to affect 
what God ultimately His plan does, right? He, his plan will be accomplished whether you do what He, you know, whether, whether you do right, wrong, or it just doesn't matter. God's will will always happen, right? God's will ultimately, uh, He's already seen all your failures, all your good things, all you've done. It. Um, so His will is set and done. It's already done, right? We don't see it as done because we don't see time like He does. But it's to Him it's already done. As a matter of fact, it was done before He even created it. And the, and the whole universe, for that matter. Um, uh, and ultimately, you can look at John 17 to see that. Um, that prayer, uh, Jesus actually prayed to God about the plan that they had in place before creation ever happened. And that plan was our salvation. Before creation ever happened. So, if they've already planned out how to, how to save us all before even the world was created, I'm pretty sure His will is going to happen. Right? And it's going to happen the way you want it to. Irregardless of what you do. Irregardless of whether you're following His will or not. But my point here is, if you are following His will, if you are doing these seven things, and, and that is a truth in your life, do what you want. Because God will be the one that shapes you. Okay? God will be the one that shows you the path that you should take. Right? Um, and if you delight in the Lord, He will give you the will that you need. Right? Um, and it's not... Now, this doesn't suggest that we should try and decipher God's will through what we can observe in His providence, right? So it's not that we um, just kind of do guesswork, right? Because um, then that puts us right back to the, the mumbo jumbo I talked about before, right? There are certain things that you want to be sure that when you're faced with a question, that you're doing it um, biblically, right? That you're answering that question biblically. And I'm going to give you some, some tips, basically, some things that you can ask yourself. So you know, is this decision I'm making going to align with God's will, right? Um, and ultimately, when you do that, then you'll find that, number one, He's going to place His will within your heart. Your answers to these questions will then be guided by Him, right? And ultimately, you'll come to the conclusion you need to come to, the will that He has for your life, right? Um, so, a, a couple of quick things. Um, uh, we are to apply wisdom to our decisions. And it says this in Ephesians 5, 17. Do not, it says it at the very beginning of it, do not be foolish. Right? Um, uh, so, and it, it calls on us to have wisdom in our decisions. And that's why we give these questions to ask. Um, uh, we're to consider our options, right? Pursue the choices that seem most wise, not just what might seem best. And that's Proverbs 2, 1 through 6. So it means if we can contemplate God's will biblically, then we'll remain in the realm of objective truth rather than subjective truth, right? So if you're going to make these decisions using biblical uh, ideas rather than just guesswork, then you'll stay with God's will. That's kind of what I'm getting at, you see? And that's what Scripture tells us. So as you decide things, make sure you're, you're going back to the Bible to get your answers, right? Don't go to, you know, the world for the answers. Because the world's going to lead you astray. Promise. All, every time. Um, Satan would love you to listen to what the world's got to say. Um, but God, uh, God won't be this great, right? Ever. Um, so, there are a few bit, uh, pitfalls trying to discern God's will through subjective means, so, you know, impressions, like, uh, uh, you know, just general ideas. So don't do that. Um, so the first thing, the first principle, first question, first thought here uh, that you should look at, principle number one, when you face, you know, a question that you're not sure of what God's will is for it, um, and it's a basic question that I ask every time when I'm faced with something like this, um, and it will just violate my understanding of the Lordship of Christ. Let me explain what I mean that, by that. Um, will it violate my conscience, right? Um, uh, will it uh, violate what I know God to believe, or what I believe God to, to want, right? Will it violate what I believe God commands for me all? And if I answer that and I think the answer is yes, obviously don't do it. Right? Um, that's your conscience speaking to you. Now I mentioned earlier about conscience, right? With your conscience is built over time. Your conscience is built over your experience of who you are. So part of what you've got to do as a Christian to build that uh, conscience to build that uh, safety meter in your system, right, is to read the Bible, is to embrace yourself with God's Word, um, is to continually search for God's will and God's wisdom through His Word, right? And as you do that, your internal uh, alarm system, if you will, will get better, 
at, at showing you um, whether something is within God's will or not, right? So the step one is your conscience. Ask yourself, will this violate my conscience? Will this make me, do I feel guilty by making this decision? Um, and if the, again, if the answer is yes, that your conscience is there for a purpose, right? Um, and it's guided typically by the Holy Spirit. Not always, sometimes your conscience can be guided by your own sinful desire. You've got to be careful of that, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But if it's guided by the Holy Spirit, that's good. That's what you want. Um, it will keep you from making the bad decisions. But don't rely on that alone, right? And that's where that's where a lot of the, the problem with these books are. They try and say you rely on that alone, your conscience and the voice within you. No, um, that's food for you uh, at best um, because it will lead you astray. Um, second question is. Um, uh, Nope. I've got scripture here. Let me read you the scripture. Uh, Romans 2, 14 through 15. For when Gentiles do not have the law, by nature, do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So this is showing us that your conscience is, God's will is already written on your heart, right? That's why your conscience convicts you. As a Christian, if you're not a Christian, you tamp down God's Holy Spirit within you so hard, usually it won't talk to you anymore, like that athlete that I mentioned, right? Um, he, he's not convicted by what he should be convicted by. He's convicted by something totally different, right? Um, another scripture for you on this is 1 Timothy 1.19. Holding faith and a good conscience, by rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith. So this verse highlights the importance of maintaining a clear conscience, right? Um, if you walk around with a guilty conscience all day long, are you an effective Christian? No. Because you're going to go to people and you're going to think to yourself, well, I can't help them. i got to help me first. <laughs> right? So if you're walking around with a guilty conscience, that's what Satan would love, because you're no longer an effective Christian. And understand, guys, Satan doesn't have to kill you. He's just got to slow you down. He's just got to stop you from sharing God's word. He's just got to get you thinking that you're not worthy. You're not good enough. And that's all he's got to do. And he wins. Right? Um, so don't let him win. Um, and the way you don't let him win is don't allow yourself to walk around with a guilty conscience. Um, stay within uh, God's will. Right? Um, number uh, two here. Will it, help me still, will it help me or benefit me spiritually? Right? And so, look. 1 Corinthians 10.23 10, says, All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. And what it's teaching us here is that, sure, you've been saved by Christ, right? And although you could do anything and you're still saved as a Christian, right? Um, that doesn't mean you should. It doesn't mean it's okay. It doesn't mean it's going to make you a better Christian, right? Um, they, there was a, a group back in uh, Paul's day um, that said, well, let's sin more because that, that gives God more glory. Yeah. Think about that. Do you think they were doing that truly to give God more glory? Because I don't. I don't. Paul saw through it. Paul saw through it. And I would see through it too. I'd say, yeah, okay, whatever. You're not trying to give God glory. You're trying to feed your own path. You're trying to feed your own flesh. Um, and that's certainly not God's will. You are living in the world instead of out of the world, right? Um, so, will it benefit me spiritually? Um, is it profitable? Is it useful? Does it help you become a better Christian? Does it teach you how to be a better Christian, right? Um, uh, will doing this enhance your spiritual life? Will it cultivate godliness in your life? Will it benefit you and build you up spiritually? And if not, you should, you should question whether or not it's worthwhile of your time, right? So, if you're a uh, good example, um, you've got time today, you can spend it either watching The Price is Right or reading your Bible. Which of those is going to build you spiritually? Probably not The Price is Right. Okay? Um, so, this is a perfect example of what God's will for your life is. It's not The Price is Right. Right? I'm sorry, it's not. God would rather you read your Bible. Um, now, does that mean never entertain yourself? No. We all have to have a little bit of entertainment. But my point is, is, if your life is guided more by what you do to spend and watching TV than 
read the Bible, then yeah, you're outside of God's will. I'm just going to say plainly and blunt. And you need to check why is that. Um, and it's probably because you're outside of God's will and you have been for so long, you no longer know what God's will is. You're not part of that seven things that we talked about in the first place. That's not true in your life, right? And that's why it's so easy for you to, you know, uh, put your Bible in the corner and gather it up instead of in your hand gathering knowledge and edifying, sanctifying, making you more like Christ so that you're ready for the day he returns. Because um, he's returning. I promise you. Um, so, will it benefit me spiritually? Number three, will it bring bondage? Let me explain what I mean by bondage, okay? Um, and, and here's a, a, a good verse for this. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. And I've, I've already given it to you once, right? Um, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. Um, all things are lawful. No, I haven't given it to you. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. But it's very similar to 1 Corinthians 10, 23, I read earlier, right? So what this is saying is, again, even though I've been saved and I can do anything effectively um, I want, um, it's lawful for me, right? Doesn't mean it's profitable. Doesn't mean it's going to make me better Christian, right? Or, again, spiritually bless me. Um, and, he says, I will not be mastered by anything. So what Paul is saying here is, you know, you can either be a, uh, a servant of God, or you can be a servant of sin. A slave of sin, if you will. Right? That's your choice. Each of us makes that choice each and every day. More than once. Right? And what he's saying here is, I'm not going to choose to be in bondage to anything, including Satan, including sin, including my own flesh. I'm only going to be a servant to God. And so when you choose those things that allow you to be in bondage, uh, then you're no longer uh, a full servant of God. You've taken something from God and given it to that thing that's got you in bondage. Yeah. So at that point, you're no longer giving all of yourself to God. You're given what you want, right? Um, and that means he's no longer Lord of your life. You have two Lords now. Whatever it is, as you in bondage and the Lord. That's not the same thing, is it? So, um, will it bring me bondage? Is it going to bond me? Um, is it going to be uh, Lord over me? Right? And if it is, shy away from me. Um, number four, will it defile God's temple? And when I say God's temple, you're God's temple. God's in each and every Christian, each and every one of them, a piece of him in all of us, if you're truly a Christian. Let me say that. If you're not, no, oh, okay, you're not God's temple. Right? Pretty simple. But if you are, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And that's God, guys. That's part of, part of who he is. Okay? And so, ultimately, if you do anything that will uh, defile, and when I say defile, right, um, uh, anything that will harm your body, bring shame to you, something you might feel ashamed of, right? Um, uh, anything like that. Um, that is defiling your temple, right? Because ultimately, if you bring scorn to yourself, and then you're bringing scorn to God, because ultimately, when people see you and they say, look at him, he's a freak. And he's a Christian? Wow. I don't know if I want that. I don't know if I want to be a Christian if that's what it looks like. Or if there are people like that that are Christians. You know what I mean? Get where I'm coming from? So if it's going to defile your temple, it, it speaks to volumes about your view of God, too, doesn't it? And it will speak volumes not just to you, but everyone around you. Including those people that we're trying to save. We're trying to help. And if they see you as some weirdo, um, is that going to you know help them find God? No. Obviously, right? Um, so if it's going to defile your temple, don't do it. Um, if it's going to bring you shame, don't do it. Because as it brings you shame, it brings God shame. Don't do it. Um, number five, will it cause anyone else to stumble? We are brothers and sisters of Christ, right? Um, and although uh, something may not bother me, right? If I know that it's going to hurt somebody else, it's just as much my duty to not do it as if it were to hurt me, right? Um, and let me give you a good example. Um, if you know somebody has an alcohol problem, and you have alcohol in your fridge, and you're inviting them over, and you tell them, man, go, go in the fridge and get yourself a drink. Are you causing your brother to stumble? Yes. Certainly. Especially if he grabs that alcohol out of your fridge. 
Okay? Um, and my point here is, it's your responsibility as a Christian to watch out for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? Um, I'm not going to put somebody in a situation that is a brother and sister in Christ where um, they can't be totally honest, they can't be totally up front. I'm not going to ask somebody to hide something from me. I'm not going to ask somebody to hold a secret from me. Ever. You know why? Because I don't want you to be faced with the question of, am I lying when I have a secret for Charles? Yes, you are, aren't you? I've caused you to stumble. So if I tell you something, you tell me what you want. Go ahead and put it that way. Because I'm not going to tell you if you can't. Right? Um, there ain't much that I can think of that I would tell you anyway that you can't. You know what I mean? Well, my point is, if you're in that position, don't cause your brother or sister to stumble. Don't ever put them in a position where they might because of you. Because if you do, then you are, you're wronging them. You're sinning against God through them. Don't do that. Okay? And if this decision is going to put you in that position where that's the case, don't do it. Do something different. Um, number six, will it further the cause of evangelism? Will it spread God's message? Or help us spread God's message? And if it won't, it's not worth your time. Period. At all. Right? Each of us is called to be witnesses of Christ. Each of us is called to spread the gospel throughout the world. And if what you're doing is not doing that, if the, the question you face um, will not make that more prevalent to happen or make it easier for you to do, it's not worth your time. Don't do it. Take your time to do those things that will. Spend your energy on those things that will exalt Christ and put Him where He should be in your world and in your life, in everyone's life. Right? Um, I'll just close my sermon. Having a hard time with technology today, guys. Just saying. Uh, it's not wanting to be nice to me for some strange reason. Um, but uh, again, if it's not going to um, further that uh, uh, grand objective that each and every one of us should have of spreading the, the the gospel to everyone that's here, it's not worth your time. Um, and number seven, will it bring, and this is the last one, will it bring glory to God? Bottom line. That's probably one of the, the biggest ones that you should ask, right? Um, and quite frankly, you should ask each and every one of these questions on all of those things that you face, right? Um, and if you do, if you do it diligently, I think what you're going to find is you'll no longer have to ask what is God's will. You'll know. Okay? Um, and that final one there, uh, will it bring glory to God? Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And did you hear that? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. So, even eating and drinking, how you live your life, even the simplest part of it, should bring glory to God. And if they're not, why not? Why not? So, um, ask each of these questions. When you're faced with something you're not sure God's will, how would God have me do this? Number one, go through those seven things that, that should already be in your life, God's revealed will. Make sure you're within His revealed will. And then if you are, ask these seven questions. And I think what you're going to find is, again, God's will will be no longer something you don't understand, don't know, can't grasp, have you know no clue what to do. Um, it'll be something that'll be easy for you, right? Um, and at that point, do what what these things guide you to. Do that, and I think what you'll find is you will become a more um, uh, peaceful Christian. You'll become a Christian that doesn't fret anymore over decisions, right? You won't have to worry about did I do the right thing. You'll know you did. You'll know you did what was bringing glory to God. And I can promise you, if I know every one of my decisions brings glory to God, hallelujah! Amen! Awesome! I know you guys know I'm, I'm happy, right? Part of why I'm happy is I'm always trying to bring glory to God with everything I do, including my happiness. Right? Um, and that's what each of you is called to do each and every day. Um, each of us should be the happiest person in the room. Each of us. 
Because the third duty is how we reach the lost. You're not going to reach the lost with a sour face. I promise you. Because if you look like you're down and out, why on earth would they want to hear what you got? You're just going to make their day worse, right? Because you got worse problems than they do if you look like a power plus. Yeah. So, live your life to bring glory to God. Um, and ultimately you'll find that these decisions become so much easier. Okay? Um, that's our uh, sermon for the day. I hope this uh, brings uh, peace to each and every one of you. I hope this shows you a, a better path for how to uh, bring the will of God into your life, how to affect the will of God through your life, um, and how to live your life as uh, a Christian that is uh, looking to live for God instead of with God. All right. um, let's, I'm going to turn things back over to Mr. Gary and uh, Ms. Donna and play us a little more music and then we'll uh, do our prayers and, and be done. All right. Have you on the lead of music? No. No. No, I ain't. <laughs> All right, take your hymn and turn to page 104. We're going to do verses 1, 3, and 5. 1, 3, and 5. Awesome. One zero four. Remind me her name. 
Linda. 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 They find out that she passed away and they don't have a chance to see her talk to her. And she was free. Wow. So they were like, and it's just so sad how families, how can you do that? Like, how can you stay away from your loved one for three years? Yeah. And then when you find out that she died, you want to take over the funeral, you want to, you know, have all the say, what's on Facebook, you want to fall out, you want to cry, you know, all this. And it's really affected me because I'm like, I don't know how to handle this. Like, what do I say as a Christian? They're all saying they're Christian. Right. And I'm like, I thought we were supposed to forgive each other. That's a long time to not forgive your sister. Sure. And um, so I've been trying to do a lot of talking to each one of them, but I'm getting overwhelmed. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I was, you know, this was calling me and this was calling me. And and instead of saying, hey, you know what, this shocked us, we're never doing this again, let's bring this together and forgive each other. Right. They're not doing that. Right. So, um, first thing my son just told me, he's like, mom, you can't control them, they're not going to do uh-huh. anything. Yeah. So, I don't have closure because there was no funeral, there was nothing. Sure. And um, I, just, I, I just need to have a prayer for my family. Right, right. Oh, you got yeah, and guidance, right? Because yes. it's hard when you're faced with, with somebody that, that claims to be a Christian and yet they're acting in the opposite direction, right? Because you feel like you've got to you've got to show them the path. And the, what the best mm-hmm. suggestion I can give you there, show them the path through your actions, right? You don't have to call them out on theirs, but show them through yours, right? Um, and that way you don't have to be confrontational because they're not going to probably listen anyway. If it's not the case. Right, I'm sure. Um, and that's what I'm saying. Instead of doing that, show them through your actions, right? Show them Christianity through who you are, um, and then they'll see. They will, whether they recognize it and call it out or not, they'll see it. And that's what they're doing. I don't want to get over this anger and this because I was talking right. to her. I didn't talk to her, so I knew everything. You know how she was doing everything. Sure. But when I talked to my other aunt, the sister. They ask me all these questions, things that they shouldn't have known because right. they, you know, they were my sister. And so now how do I show myself to be a Christian? Yeah. And they all are Christians. Sure. Do again, do what you can with you, um, and pray. Pray. Okay. Um, pray for them. Call me later and we'll talk about it later a little more too, okay? Because there are more things that I can help you with and tell you. But um, okay. I would start with those two things. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, um, and that's hard. That's hard, especially in that situation where it's somebody that's passed. And this should be a, a, a whole different situation than what you're faced with. So I'm sorry. Um, that. Okay. But um, give me my prayers as well. But call me. Okay. Seriously. Right. Um, and that was it, right? Those yeah. were the two. Okay. Um, any? And I know. Um, I know. I had yes. Uh, Hazel, you're having surgery, right? Um, my surgery is my spine is at seven thirty. It's coming Friday. Okay, Friday at thirty. But to get up there, we take further. Mm-hmm. Hazel, Friday at seven thirty a.m. Back surgery. What hospital, honey? Yeah. Could be a not a good. Bottom just what hospital? What hospital? It's an What hospital? Hospital. Oh, uh, at the uh, Friday. Friday. And it's this coming Friday then? Friday. Mm-hmm. I have to the calendar what date that is. Um, alright. Um, 28th. 28th, okay. Henry's having surgery on Friday too. And Henry as well. And his is for a bone, right? A healing of a bone? I thought it was that, wasn't it? 
And then we had um, some injections in between some of the vertebrae because the blood is bone on bone. Right. So we had some injections there to put kind of a cushion between the vertebrae, okay. which should alleviate the pain. Right. However, it has not been an instantaneous. Sure. Uh, process of the pain being <coughs> well, so we really need to pray for Henry to recover to gain his strength for him to be free of the pain right. and for God to be able to have it be a blessing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So is he doing more is he doing more injections Friday or I don't know. He had one he had uh, two injections last Friday. Okay. Maybe maybe I have to leave and for the people who do not know Henry, we can all learn a lesson from Henry because with what he's going through, I've never seen a frown. There's always been a smile, and he will joke and have fun. We can learn a lesson from Henry and really say a prayer that the injections work for him. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah, and that's kind of what we were talking about with the sermon that we just talked about. That, you know, have a have a positive attitude. <laughs> um, that's, that's your duty as a Christian. He has a twinkle in his eye that only God puts there. No doubt, no doubt. Um, that peace that passes all understanding. Yeah, no doubt. Um, all right. Uh, I know we had one or two more. My mother-in-law, or my daughter-in-law's mother, they're testing for Parkinson's disease, and Amy's really concerned. Her name is Linda Drees. Linda Drees. Mm-hmm. And testing for purpose. Right. Um, Alright, and others. You knew there was one more, I think. Yes. It's my husband, Phil. Yes. And Roger's a humorist. Not me. It's not funny. <laughs> Henry, right? No. Kevin. Kevin. I knew it was Kenny something. <laughs> it's Kenny. And going back to Gwen, she's still very, very suffering terribly from bronchitis and now needing oxygen. And that's uh, Gwen Rao, right? Right. And Carol Winter, still in recovery. She, uh, she's been home now a while, but she is extremely exhausted and I'm hoping that the clock will be clock will be exhausted right okay okay um any others Charles yes last week I asked for prayers for my neighbor who had a heart attack he passed away his neighbor Jim I don't know what his last name was but he passed away this past week Father, thank you for uh, the family that I have here at Harmony. 
Thank you for each and every person here. Lord, I, um, I know that uh, we're going through a world that is filled with pain and anger and malice and, and hurt and deceit. But Father, I know when I walk through the doors here, uh, or roll through the doors here, um, that I'm surrounded by loving people, Christians that are true, and, and uh, Christians that love you with all their heart. And Father, I thank you for bringing me to such a place. Of all the places that, that I could learn and grow and, and become closer to you, this is the perfect place for that to happen. And I thank you for that, Father. I thank you for bringing me here in the first place. Lord, I have many things on our prayer list to come bring before you today. And Father, I ask first and foremost in each and every one of these cases, irregardless of what I ask for, Father, I ask that first and foremost your will be done. Lord, I know that, that irregardless of what we do, your will will be done. But Father, in each of these cases, I ask that your will, those seven things that we discussed, would be done in each and every one of these lives. That, Father, that they would have a, a life of thankfulness. That, Father, they would have a life of joy, of peace, of understanding. That, Father, each and every one of these people, irregardless of the situation they're going through, that they would have an understanding and peace that passes understanding from others. That, Lord, that they would be able to turn to you with each and every one of these problems and face it full on with no, no doubts, no fear, no anger, no worry. And Father, that each and every person in here would turn to you every time they have an issue that they're un unsure of what to do. And that Father, for each and every time that they are faced with uh, pain or uh, faced with uh, doubt or faced with uh, not knowing what the future brings, that Father, that they would turn to you for those answers first. And that Lord, they would give it all to you. That they wouldn't try and bottle it up in their own heart. That they wouldn't try and solve it on their own will. That they would give to you, Father. And that they would allow you, with uh, the Lord that can do anything, to have your way with it and your will with it. Father, I bring all of these uh, prayers to you today in uh, humble supplication, Father. I ask, the Lord, that first and foremost, your will would be done, um, and your perfect will would be done in each and every case. Father, I hold up to you uh, Malaya, um, who's five years old, and her kidneys are pain. And Father, I know you know what's best for her. And Lord, I know you're going to be merciful to her. Father, I ask that you help this little girl. And that Lord, through it, she has a story that she can tell of the day that the Lord has saved her. Father, I, I know that that's a powerful witness. And Father, I ask that, that glory be shown through this little girl. Glory for you. And Father, I ask that you would help her through this. That either through miracle or surgery or whatever, whatever your will is, that she would come out of this, Father, and have a wonderful witness of your love and mercy and your power. Father, I hold up to you, Lorraine, uh, who's been in the hospital for five days. And uh, it seems that the, the wound she had on her leg has, has grown a, uh, a fungus. Father, I ask that, Lord, through all of this, if she is feeling any uh, worry or concern or uh, uncertainty, that, Lord, you would take all that away. You would remind her that you're there with her. And that, Father, through all of this, she can be uh, able to take peace in the knowledge that you're there with her. <coughs> Lord, I ask that, um, that you would help her through this situation and that you would guide her steps in each and every one of these um, uh, places in the hospital that she's at. Father, I hold up to you, uh, Linda, uh, the aunt of Leisha, who passed recently. And Father, first of all, I hold the whole family up to you. And Lord, I ask that, that you would show your true witness within that family. That Lord, you would show your true love within that family. And that Father, that through um, those who are true Christians, that they would shine a light so bright that it would wake up the others that have camped down the Holy Spirit within their hearts so bad that they no longer are convicted by it. Father, I ask that, that that light would shine through all of the darkness and that it would show each and every one of those persons how they can become better servants of you, how they can come back to your will. And Father, I ask that there would be peace and forgiveness and understanding and all those fruits of the Spirit would be in abundance within this family. And that they would become uh, closer through all of this. And that they would call upon this later in life 
and be reminded of how they grew as a family closer through all of these painful things going on today. Father, I um, ask that you would touch each and every one of them and show them your will for their life. Lord, I hold up to you uh, Hazel, uh, who's having surgery on Friday, and ask, Lord, that you would uh, comfort her through all of this. That, Father, you would take away any fear that she has. That, Lord, you would remind her you're the God of possibility, not the God of fear. That you, Lord, can make anything happen that's within your will. And that, Father, that through this, she'll have another mm-hmm. prayer answer. And that she will be uh, just fine after this surgery. Father, I ask that you would bring her back to us faith and sound. And that, Lord, she would be uh, in much better shape, uh, much better able to share your love and uh, your witness with others. Lord, I hold up to you, Henry, um, who's having continuous injections to help the back pain and problems that he has. Father, I know you're not done with him. I know you're not. Um, and Lord, I ask that you would remind him of that. I know that, Father, he carries on a, a beautiful persona. That, Father, he exalts you in everything that he does. Lord, I ask that that not end. That, Father, that you would give him the strength and uh, perseverance that he needs to continue to show that beautiful uh, witness of you. Uh, that beautiful uh, understanding and fruit of the Spirit that shows that you're in his life. And that, Father, that you rule his life. Lord, I hold up to you, um, Linda Reese. Uh, who's having testing for Parkinson's and ask Father that through all of this that she would um, come closer to you um, that Lord irregardless of the answer that she gets that it would bring her more fully as a Christian before you that Father that she would bow her knee to you and, and understand that no matter what you bring you're there with her and you walk through it with her Father I hold up to you Kim uh, who has a fractured humor and Father I ask that you would awaken him that, Lord, you would open his eyes. That, Father, that you would show him the truth behind all that he sees. That, Lord, that through this fracture, he would become a closer servant of you. That, Father, he would uh, begin to hear your voice. That, Lord, the veil would be lifted. That, Father, that he would see perfectly, for the first time, the truth of, of all that he already knows. That's written on his heart. But he, he's veiled from it right now. Father, I ask that this would be the event that would bring this about. Lord, I ask that you would help him through all of this, that you would bring him comfort and relief. And that, Father, that you would do your work in him and use him for your glory. Lord, I hold up to you, uh, Miss Chop, who's having shoulder surgery on the 18th. And ask, Father, that you would do comfort and take away any fear that she has from the surgery. That, Lord, you would help her through this and guide her doctors. And that, Father, on the other side of it, Lord, she would become... Uh, more close to you. Father, I hold up to you um, Richard, uh, who has Parkinson's. And I hold him up to you for salvation, Father. I ask, Lord, that you would, again, as I said for another, that you would awaken in his mind exactly and take away the veil that has hidden you from him. Father, I ask that you would show him the truth, that, Lord, that he would finally see um, uh, the truth and accept it. Not just see it, but accept it. Because I think he does see it. Lord, I ask that you would have him accept it. And that, Father, that he would accept he's a sinner. And that he's fallen away from you. And that, Lord, he would come back to you. That he would be uh, just like the, um, the story of uh, the prodigal son. That he would come running back to you, Father. And that, Lord, that you would accept him with open arms. And you would kill the fat and calf. And, Father, that you would have a great celebration as he came back into your flock. Father, I ask this for Richard. Before anything else, Father, I ask this be done. Lord, I hold up to you Matthew, who fell ten feet and fractured his ankle. And I ask, Lord, that you would work in his life. That through all of this, Father, as he recovers, um, he would not lose his spirit. And his spirit within you, or your spirit within him, I should say, would grow and become stronger. Father, I hold up to you Carol Bennett, uh, who's at home in recovery but exhausted. Father, I ask that you would give her strength. And Lord, I ask that that strength would come through your word. Father, I ask that she would be more ingratiated to your, your love. Uh, she would be uh, more uh, open uh, to hearing your voice, Father, because she's more fully in your word. Lord, I hold up to you Sarah Peterson, that back of you, in pain. She's 80 years old. Um, and Father, I ask that you would ease some of that pain. 
but Lord, that you would do it in such a way that she knows it comes from you. That, Father, that she would see that easing of pain as a gift from you. And that, Lord, she would thank you for it. That she would hold you up for it. That, Father, she would exalt you for it. Lord, I ask that you would give her a reason to praise. And that that praise would first be you. Lord, I hold up to you, uh, Ricky, and thank you that she's getting so much better. And Father, I ask that you continue to walk with her, and you continue to strengthen her, and you continue to give her balance and uprightness, and Father, righteousness, and Lord, that you would help her to walk your path with you. Father, I hold up to you, Steve Glover, who has some justice heart today, and I ask that you would work in his life, that Father, that you would show him the path forward, and that he would have the strength to follow it. Lord, I hold up to you, Pauline Tom, um, who broke her finger and had surgery. And I ask, Lord, that you continue to help her. And I praise you that her condition has gotten better than what it was. And, Father, I ask that it continue to grow uh, and get better each and every day that she would grow as a Christian. Father, I hold up to you, Betty, um, in praise. She's doing better. With in plans of vacation for Europe. And, Father, I ask that that vacation would remind her of your glory. That seeing your glory, your creation, would remind her of your glory and, and your love. And that, Father, that it would bring her closer to you. Father, I hold up to you, um, Tom, who has carcinoma, um, and ask, Lord, that you continue to uh, help him with this uh, disease. That, Father, that he would stay uh, the bright-eyed Christian that he is. That, Lord, you would give him strength, and uh, that you would give him uh, uh, peace in knowing that through all of this you're with him. And that, Father, no matter what it brings, um, he does know in the end where he goes. And Lord, let that bring in peace. Let that bring in resolve. Um, and Father, let it also uh, remind him of his duty and to witness um, to his family first. Lord, I hold up to you, Gwen Rao, um, and ask that Father, you would uh, uh, help her doctors to understand what's going on with her pacemaker. That Lord, you would uh, uh, give her peace of mind as well. That Lord, you would take away any fear. Father, I hold up to you, Linda Worley. Uh, who's a wife and a caregiver. And I ask, Father, that you would give her the strength to be the caregiver and the wife that she should be. And, Father, I ask that, um, that through all of this, you would remind her that you're there with her, that you as her father will guide her in every aspect of her life. And that, Lord, she need only turn to you um, when she's feeling weak. Father, I hold up to you, Alicia, um, and ask, Lord, that you would give her strength, that, Father, you would give her answers to the questions that I can that, Lord, that she would have perfect discernment and understanding for what's going on with her family. That, Father, you would give her help in knowing how best to, uh, to witness to her family. How best to uh, handle all these different um, things going on. And how, how to come out of it as a better Christian. Father, I hold up to you, Carol Alda, in praise that she's doing better and walking and, and doing well in therapy. Father, I hold up to you, uh, Carol uh, Kyle in praise that she seems to be back down. Father, I hold up to you, Shelly, um, Vivian's daughter, uh, who had thyroid uh, cancer and grave disease. And I ask, Lord, that you would continue to help her in her recovery, uh, that you would continue to work in her life and continue to help her through everything she's going through. <coughs> Father, I, I praise you so much. Cindy's found a place. Um, she's going to be moving in in a moment. Um, Lord, thank you for finding the place that she even told me she knew it was from you because it came at exactly the right time. Father, thank you for that. And I thank you so much more for the fact that she knew it was from you. And she thanked me for our prayers because she said that God answered them. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for showing her the power of prayer. Thank you for showing her that true worship and love that you're always there for her. Father, continue to strengthen this, this uh, young Christian. Continue to show her the path forward. Continue to help her in all that she does. Continue to make her a better Christian each and every day. Father, I hold up to you, Nathan, uh, who's 19 and has stomach problems, stomach issues. And I ask that, Lord, that you would help his doctors, give them understanding and discernment, um, and that you would help them uh, know what he needs to, to be better. Uh, and, Father, that this would guide him, that this would strengthen his faith. Um, that it would make him a better person, a better man, a better Christian. Father, I hold up to you, um, Kate Pierce, who has a broken pelvis. And I hold praise, Father, because she's doing so well, even with such a, a hard uh, uh, problem to have, such a hard uh, uh, malady to go through. 
Father, I ask that you would continue to give her strength, continue to give her a purpose in life, that you would continue to show her the path forward. Father, I hold up to you Samuel and I turned her on his elbow. And I ask, Lord, that you would continue to help him get back to work, um, get back to normal life. And that, Father, through this, he would praise you. Lord, I hold up to you Tanner, who has a hurt back and pain for moving. And, Father, I ask that you would uh, uh, ease that pain and do so in such a way that Tanner gives you glory for it. That uh, Tanner is, is holding up your name um, in, in praise and, uh, and, and glory. Father, I hold up to you, uh, Thelma, who's in the hospital, and ask the Lord that you would give, guide her to her doctor. Father, I hold up to you, um, Virginia Sasser, who's in the hospital, and ask the Lord also that you would strengthen her, that you would uh, help her doctors to know how best to treat what's going on. Father, I hold up to you, Diana Duclos, um, and ask the Lord that you would continue to work in her life, continue to have your will in her way. Father, I hold up to you, Maggie's daughter, Lisa, and ask that you would uh, continue to work in her life, that you would continue to strengthen her, uh, guide her as a Christian. Father, I hold up to you, uh, uh, Angela, who has breast cancer, uh, and ask the Lord that you would uh, strengthen her as a Christian, that you would take away any fear that she has. Father, I hold up to you, Pat, in England, and Bridget, who has cancer, and ask that you would work in their life. Lord, I hold up to you all the residents here at Harmony, um, especially those that are not in this room. And Father, I ask that you would guide each and every one to this room. Um, that, Lord, you would show them that um, you are the only ones with answers. And the only way for us to get those answers is to study you more. Father, I ask that, that each and every resident here uh, would be cared for as if they were family. That, Father, each and every um, employee here would love their job because they know they're doing your work. They're doing what we're all called to do and that's to serve our fellow brothers and sisters. Father, I ask that each and every uh, staff member here would take their job uh, to the highest, um, would understand that what they're doing is important work, and Father, that they wouldn't squander uh, the time that they have to, to be able to do your work and your will. Father, I hold up to you, um, Alex de Tessere, um, and ask the Lord that you would work in his life, as well as his Carol, his wife, and Leah and Luke, their children. Uh, Father, I hold up to you, our Donna, uh, here, that plays the piano, and ask, Lord, you would continue to strengthen her, strengthen her lungs. Continue to, to give her, uh, each and every day, a new burst of, of energy and spirit. And that, Father, that she would be uh, your servant uh, here for as long as time can come. Father, I hold up to you, Sarah Peterson, um, uh, whose back and legs and, and, and such are giving her trouble. And ask, Father, that you would work in her life. I hold up to Butch, who has COPD. I ask that you would continue to give his Christian spirit um, uh, strength and, and character. Father, I hold up to Lonnie and his family in prayer. And I ask, Lord, that you would, uh, uh, first of all, that you would remind everyone in this situation that they're there um, from the death of the loved one. And that, Lord, that, uh, that they should be reminded from that, that each and every one of us has to meet our maker. And that, Lord, each and every one of us has to live a life pleasing to you. That, Father, that each and every one of us is saved by you. Um, but, Father, that doesn't give us license and ability to just be mean and nasty to each other. And it doesn't mean that it's okay for us to covet um, something from someone who's not. Father, uh, help each and every one of these people see the truth. Help each and every one of these people, um, rather than coveting, material things, that they would covet the relationship with their family, that they would covet love first, that they would covet having a more perfect relationship with you, Father, rather than material garbage that burns in the fire. Father, help them see the truth that all that they are coveting is gone already. They just don't see it. And unfortunately, Father, if they covet more, um, I'm fearful, I'm fearful for them. Father, I ask that you would awaken them, that you would take away this this uh, uh, deception in their heart, and that, Lord, that you would help them understand the truth and be able to move forward in love instead of in grief. Father, I hold up to you um, Michael Weston, who has pancreatic cancer. And, Father, I ask that you would uh, help this young man. Um, he's in his 30s. And that, Father, that this, this would bring him closer to you. And that you use him as a witness of your glory, Father. Lord, I hold up to you, Terry, and thank you so much that you're helping her with her medication. 
that Father, that, uh, that she is uh, doing well, even without having medication for two weeks uh, that she normally takes. Father, I ask that you continue that. I ask that uh, her health continue to increase and, and get better and better each day. And that, Father, that she would give you glory for it each and every day. That, Lord, she would be thankful for it each and every day. And that, Father, she would tell somebody about it each and every day. Father, I ask all of these things in your Son's precious name. In the name of my Lord, my Messiah, my Savior, I pray. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful week, a wonderful service. I hope each and every one of you has a great week, and God bless. If you need me, call me. If you have my number, if you don't have my number, and some of you don't, I know you do, um, come get it from me. Uh, I'd love to, love to give it to you. And if you need anything, call me anytime. Can't promise you I'll be awake if you call at 2 in the morning. But even if you want to call at 2 in the morning, that's okay. Because I love you. All right? God bless everyone. Have a great week. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>